This is C.J. Baker, and this is an epic soundtrack to a mundane existence. So as previously mentioned, I'm part of a music community, tastes like music. And as part of that community, every week a member selects an album for everyone to listen to. Also, the album has to meet the criteria of having a low number of community ratings on Rate Your Music. So this week, it just happened to be my turn to pick. So initially, I was thinking possibly selecting a more obscure and potentially a more challenging album. But I realized that one of my all-time favorite albums, the Trinity Session by Cowboy Junkies, was eligible. So as soon as I realized that, I just had to select it. So I kind of debated whether or not I was happy or disappointed that it was eligible. Because ultimately, I love this album so much, I want everyone to listen to it and rate it and love it. But because this album is an important part of the epic soundtrack, My Monday in Existence, I decided I'll make a video as well. And I'm thinking that if this goes well, I may make this a weekly feature. So every week I might record a video discussing uh, album, song, or artists, or something else that's musically related that's had an uh, impact on my life. So if this is a regular feature that you want to see, please like, subscribe, and let me know in the comments. Also in this video, I'm going to be trying something a little bit different, or a little bit different for me. I'm going to be including some clips in these video. So they should fall under fair use laws. So please don't sue me because I'm broke. So I'll get right into the album. So the Trinity Session, this was the follow-up to... Cowboy Junkie's 1986 debut album, Rights Off Earth Now. So the debut was recorded in a garage that the band used for rehearsing. So it's interesting to note the band's quiet sound. It was partly a result of noise complaints from neighbors. So in order not to create any issues with the neighbors, they had to learn how to play and record quietly. And then they also independently released that album on their own record label, Layton. So now it was time to follow up that album. So in connection with the follow-up, lead single Margot Timmons explains in the following clip for the Trinity session, they wanted to pursue lo-fi recording technique similar to the debut. And then uh, we put out White Soft Earth Now, which was our first record which was done uh, to one microphone, recorded with one microphone in our garage. And when it came time to do the second album, which was Trinity Session, we wanted to use the same recording technique. So in order to help with this objective, they recorded the album on November 27th, 1987, at the Church of the Holy Trinity in Toronto. So hence, the name of the album. So with the exception of the a cappella track, Mining for Gold, it was all recorded during a single 12-hour session. So yes, that's a pretty impressive feat to create such a classic landmark album in less than a day. So as mentioned on the album sleeve, there was no mixing, overdubbing, or editing in any way. 
So they truly created an album that had an organic human feel. So the acoustics of the church played an important role in the sound of the album. So just like being forced to play quiet in the garage, the having to slow down was another cruel serendipitous moment that became a part of the band's signature sound. So both the band and specifically this album were foundational in the development of Slowcore. And it was an unplanned response because of the church reverb. It's true there was some slow call elements on the debut, but on Trinity Session, they took it even further. Also, by applying the slow call approach to folk, country, and the blues, this ended up being an important contribution to the development of alt country. So similar to the debut album, it was initially released on their independent label, Layton. And it was released early 1988. But due to the buzz that the album received, they subsequently were signed to RCA and it received a wider release on November 26, 1988. It also ended up selling over a million copies in the U.S., which was a pretty good return on their investment when you consider their biggest expense was a couple hundred dollars for the church rental. So, of course, the most well-known track on the album is the gorgeous cover of the Velvet Underground's tune, Sweet Jane. Sweet Jane. Um, Sweet Jane. Well, I guess Sweet Jane is the song that most people connect with uh, the Trinity Session album. And certainly it, um, it did its job. <laughs> it got us a lot of attention and I owe my house to it. And the song also received increased attention when it appeared in the 1994 Oliver Stone film, Natural Bone Cures. And concerning Cowboy Junkies classic rendition of this tune, Lou Reed has gone on record that this was his favorite and most authentic version of the song. But really, it's just one of several highlights on the album. For example, there's the absolutely stunning Blue Moon Revisited song for Elvis. So the song was part original and part cover of the Rogers and Hart pantoon. So the song, the arrangement was based on Elvis's version of the song. But even when the band plays it straight with the music arrangement, Margot's ethereal vocals is the X factor that adds a different dynamic to the songs. And not only does the album display their impeccable ability as interpreters, but their originals are fantastic as well. For example, there's the haunted, to love is the berry. And then there's the bluesy, 200 more miles, that well articulates what life is like on the road as a touring musician. And then there's my absolute favorite off the album and one of my all time favorite tunes, Miss Guided Angel. 
So the music video was my first exposure to the band in my preteens slash early teens. They used to get decent rotation on much music, which was basically Canadian MTV. And this was back in the days where they played music videos. So this was before, like for me, this is basically one of my earliest memories in defining moments in connection with music because it was actually before the floodgates completely opened up for me. Like the pivotal year for my musical awakening was 1991. And then Nirvana's Nevermind was my musical gateway drug. But even at the young age, I connected to the song. So I might have been too young to relate to the lyrics about loving someone you shouldn't. But there was something about the song that appealed to me on an emotional level. So even at that age, I was starting to feel angst. And even though it was different musically on an emotional level, there were parallels to the music that I would eventually be drawn to. The song still hits me really hard in the feels. And it was also an unusual song to be getting decent rotation on much music because it didn't sound like the pop or rock getting played at the time. And that's actually part of the reason why the album stands the test of time. It really sounds unique and there's really nothing else that really sounds like it. So the album was included in the 2005 book, 1001 Albums You Must Hear Before You Die. And I absolutely agree. Heavy human being alive should listen to this album at least once. So if you haven't listened to it, I strongly implore you to do so. If you have listened to it, what do you think? Love, like, hate, hopefully you don't hate it. But please let me know in the comments. Also, what music makes up your personal epic soundtrack? Feel free to leave in the comments as well. So thanks for listening. And please stay safe.